You guys, you guys can hear me? Great. Um, I want to thank Ollie, thank the group. Uh, thank you for asking me to talk. It's an honor and a privilege uh, to participate in AA. It's a responsibility to give back what was so freely given to me. Um, I, I heard Chris, I, I heard all of you guys, and I, I just, what it, I just, I just love the big book. I, I, for some reason, after all the institutions and treatment centers that I went through, um, I got around a group of big book enthusiasts. And I, I was, um, you know, I want to welcome the people that are new. If you're, you're trying AA again, if you don't want to be here, if you don't think AA will work for you, I, I didn't get here because I had a bad weekend. Um, I had a couple of bad decades. And for me, like a lot of us, this becomes a matter of life and death. There's a, there's a part in the 12 and 12. And one of the things my, my, my late sponsor, Dan S., said to me, he said, Adam, it doesn't matter who's wrong. It doesn't matter who's right. It just matters who's left. And when I started to look at people with long-term recovery, 10, 20, 30 years that were chasing their dreams, that had relationships that worked, that were able to navigate around the drama, people that were enthusiastic about their life, I started to pay attention to that. And there's a, there's a part of the 12 and 12 in the ninth tradition where it is a very specific thing. It says, if any member fails to practice the 12 steps to the best of their ability, they're signed their own death warrant. And for me, um, you know, I remember looking back at it now after, you know, being one of those perpetual chip takers, I thank God for the unconditional love of the old timers, a lot of the old timers that aren't with us anymore. And, you know, they would say stuff to me like, don't even bother taking chips, just sit in the back, shut up, but, but in a loving way, right? But they made it really clear to me. And if you're new, I hope you hear this. They made it really clear to me that if and when I was ready, because they could see it by my demeanor, my lack of interest, my fidgety nature, my general attitude. Those old timers had the wisdom to see that it wasn't right now. But if you're new, those old timers made it really clear to me that if and when I was ready, that the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous would always be open to a drunk like me. And I think looking back at that experience now, next to my parents, AA is the closest thing to unconditional love that a drunk like me will ever experience. No matter how many lives I destroyed, how many people I burned, how many jobs I lost, how many hearts I broke, how many cars I wrecked, how many despicable, shameful things I did. And if you're new and you are, in fact, an alcoholic, it's the most shameful thing in the world to be the family drunk. I mean, especially like me, I come from a very big family. There's, there's, I have a whole group of family in Canada that have not talked to me in 30 years. A whole side of my family lives in Toronto. They still will not talk to me. So if you think amends are going to fix everything, they don't. And, you know, to watch my mom and dad, I was, a, I was a straight A student. I was an only child. I was atop of all my classes. And, and I found alcohol. And to watch my mom and dad literally watch me burn my life to the ground, to the point where eventually... My, my mother had sold the family property, moved, and did not leave a forwarding address. That's where I left that woman. And despite all of that, the doors of AA have always been open to people like me. If I live to be 100 years old, I could never pay AA back for the love and kindness. That, you know what some of you people have shown me? Not all. I mean, if you like everybody in AA, you know what it means? It means you're probably not going to enough meetings. Eventually, I started coming to meetings drunk. Um, it's funny because you don't see a lot of wet alcoholics in AA anymore, right? I don't want to bash the therapeutic community, but because of treatment, which is now a $35 billion industry, um, you know, which swoops people like me up in my most desperate moments, right? Throws me into yoga class. Somehow that's going to fix me, right? Craft hour. I'm making belt buckles and bongs. So what I would do, and I'm just going to, I'm going to get to the book in a second. I would go to 7-Eleven. I would get a, 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 a bottle of whiskey or a bottle of liquor. I would, I would go to the late night Hollywood candlelight meeting. And then I would do some of my best sharing, right? And then I started going through treatment centers. And it's very interesting. I don't know if anybody's read the chapter to Wise, but the chapter to Wise talks about four types of alcoholics, type one, type two, type three. And the fourth type of alcoholic described in the chapter to Wise is the type of alcoholic that's been placed in one institution after another. 
the type of alcoholic that typically drinks on his way home from the hospital. And in the 17 years that I recycled through the rooms, that's what I eventually became. Even though I'd been exposed to all of the information in Alcoholics Anonymous, I could recite chapter three, chapter five, the 12 traditions verbatim. I couldn't make it past a liquor store. And there's, uh, I remember telling my sponsor that I, I, I eventually, what happened is I, I went through residential treatment for alcoholism 28 times. I remember telling my sponsor, I went through treatment 28 times and he started laughing hysterically. And he said to me, Adam, going through treatment 28 times, that doesn't make you an alcoholic. And I thought, you're kidding. He says, no, that just means you paid half a million dollars for a big book. See, treatment was a great place to fat me up for another run. Treatment has its rightful place in recovery. Even Bill Wilson had gone through treatment. If you look at the doctor's opinion, even Dr. Silkworth says we favor hospitalization or treatment for the alcoholic that's befogged or jittery. Some people don't go through treatment. It is not a prerequisite for, for AA. In fact, if you ever wonder what all the treatment centers and religions have in common, it's that they all send their drunks to us. But if you're new today, treatment never solved the problem. And as an alcoholic, like many of us, I always thought the problem was liquor. I thought it was alcohol. And I remember someone in AA saying to me, Adam, if alcohol is your problem, that drink, that shot glass, that 12 pack, that little glass of Chardonnay, if that's your problem, you're probably not an alcoholic. And then he paused. And in the very next breath, he says to me, and if you are in fact an alcoholic, the type that's described in the doctor's opinion in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, your problem is not alcohol. And he, it took another decade, another decade of suffering for me to understand the impact of that statement. It was almost like some kind of cruel riddle. I drank over that for years. But what happened to me to cut to the chase, what happened to me is I got around a group of big book enthusiasts, people that took the statements in the big book turned them into questions and directed the questions at me. Questions like, was I incapable of being honest with myself? Questions like, did I in fact drink because I liked the effect produced by alcohol? Duh, well, that's a no brainer, right? Questions like, was I restless, irritable and discontent by nature? There's a good question. Was that my natural state before I took a drink? Was my greatest obsession that somehow, someday, I would control and enjoy my drinking at the same time? And the last piece, did I pursue that illusion, meaning just out of reach, to the gates of insanity and death? And as I started to go through those considerations, if you're new, for the first time, I saw the truth. And the most obvious truth, the external unmanageability, clear as a bell. It was obvious I couldn't live with alcohol, even as a teenager. I was already peeing in my pants, already drooling on my desk, already passed out under the bleachers. My nickname in eighth grade was Space Cadet. I couldn't find homeroom. I always overshot the mark. People were picking high schools. I was picking rehabs. But if you're new today, alcoholism comes in people. It doesn't come in bottles or six packs or 12 packs or kegs or shot glasses or little glasses of wine. Alcoholism comes in people. And the greater aspect of this spiritual illness, as Bill Wilson describes it, centering in my mind, if going through the considerations in the big book shows me anything at all, it shows me that an alcoholic of my type, an alcoholic of this type, cannot really live without alcohol, not successfully, not happily. And part of what it really seems to mean for me to be an alcoholic, if I'm honest about my relationship with liquor, is that I seem to have a mind that will consistently take me back to that first drink. Every time I get released from an emergency room, a hospital, a fancy Malibu treatment center, right? Men's Central Jail, 5743, you roll it up. It's like, as soon as I hear my release number, I have this visceral compulsion to drink that is so powerful in me that I can't even stop at the release module for my property. That compulsion within me is so powerful. And when I hear people, you know, say things like don't drink no matter what, it's almost like this complete failure to acknowledge page 24, where it says every alcoholic passes through the state where even the strongest desire is of absolutely no avail. It is telling me my willpower becomes virtually non-existent. So if you're new, when I hear don't drink no matter what, I translate that into go to meetings no matter what. 
work steps no matter what, maintain commitments no matter what, help others no matter what. And somehow by doing these seemingly unrelated actions, I seem to get the grace. Somehow there becomes this distance between me and that first dream. So if you're like me, all of my life, I was one decision away from a dream. And between me and that decision today, if you're new, there is a whole world called recovery. It's about people like you. It's about the rooms of AA. Maybe it's about this new platform we call Zoom. It's about a design for living. It's about a roadmap to spiritual success. Uh, for many of us, it is about this mystery we call God, which like, like a deep and effective spiritual experience is the product of, again, taking actions that I did not believe in. But somehow between me and that decision now, there is a whole world called recovery. And I did not understand that very, very powerful thing. So what it really means, if you're new, for someone like me to be an alcoholic is I have a mind that will continue again to take me back to that first drink. It's almost like my default mode, like on a computer. And I've, I've had the privilege of sponsor a lot of really smart guys. I live in a place, Santa Monica. It's now called Silicon Beach. We have about 250 tech companies that, that run our city. And, you know, a lot of these guys come into AA, they're programmers, they design hardware, software, they write and code and uh, far my intellectual superior, but they're alcoholic. And the joke is alcoholism plus potential equals zero. But we discuss the, the language that Bill Wilson uses in 1939, because it's very important to say this, because we use the word program today all the time. It wasn't so popular in 1939, but one of the definitions of a, the word program, if you look it up in the dictionary, is a sequential set of instructions, right, designed to bring about a result. Now, listen to the parallel language. What do you do when you get a corrupt file on the computer? Well, it's obvious. You install a recovery disk, right? And what's the function of that disk? It restores the program to an earlier point in the process, just like the second step, like you throw a stone into a body of water, it becomes still again, right? It never occurred to me that steps 10 and 11 effectively for me become like a viral scan. That if I follow these very specific instructions in the big book, what happens when I get to step 10 is I start to become mindful. Suddenly, I'm able to watch where I paint the red flag screen. I see my selfishness, this attitude that I can do whatever I want and not pay the consequences, the dishonesty, the lies that I tell myself. The resentment, which is my faulty emotional attachment to people, places, and things. And my fear, this driving force, which is, again, a faulty relationship with God based on self-reliance. And once I start to really become aware of this, the mindfulness, the awakening in step 10, what happens is I become transparent if you're new. I become accountable. I become visible. Now, these may not matter to you, but for me, it became a very, very powerful spiritual experience. And as a lot of people have said, what is the big book saying? What does it mean? And what do I do? It's giving me a very specific set of instructions that if I take these instructions specifically four through nine, what happens again is I start to be able to live in this world of 10, 11, and 12. I start to understand that when I get to 11, I'm starting to bookend my day. When I retire at night, again, I'm going to be aware of this review. Again, the selfishness, the dishonesty, the resentment, the fear. Upon awakening, I, there's six prayers there. Everywhere, if you look through the book where it says ask, every one of those is a prayer. We ask God to direct our thinking. We ask to be divorced from self-seeking motives, to be divorced from self-will. It's very critical. Now, this doesn't matter to a lot of people. But for me, if I want to be able to navigate around the drama, if I want to grow in effectiveness and understanding, what happens, I have to start to apply these ideas to my life. It never occurred to me when Bill Wilson says principles before personalities, it was our founder's future hope that these spiritual instructions, these guidelines would have more impact than the sometimes hysterical, untethered opinions that we encounter in the fellowship. And I love the fellowship of AA. I love going to Denny's, hanging out, the barbecues, the weddings. But, you know, my mom would have parties with 300 people. I grew up in a huge family of people. They were at a business with all these entertainers. And, you know, I was an only, I was the boy wonder of that family. The fellowship, like it says in the second chapter, and there's a warning there. It says the fellowship in that first paragraph in chapter two is but one element 
in the powerful cement that binds us, right? And then it says it would have never held us together. There's the warning as we are now joined. If you're new, the fellowship gives me enthusiasm. It gives me inspiration. It gives me encouragement. It gives me hope, right? Brotherly love. Some people actually find relationships and employment here. But if you unleash a character like me into a large group of people without guiding principles, my goodness, my character defects thrive. I actually get sicker in the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what happens is somehow I become more separate, more different, and more alone. And if you haven't heard that terminology, what that actually means is separated from God. It means different than every single person here. We call that terminal uniqueness. And alone, you know that loneliness, that ache in the heart of every one of us that really has nothing to do with the proximity or closeness of other people. In fact, the bigger the crowd, the more alone I am at my own wedding, my own birthday. That loneliness at the core of my spirit, when I hit that pillow at night, and if you know what that feels like, what that actually is, is my inability to connect. And you put a couple of drinks in me, I'm calling people from fifth grade saying, I love you. I go right into amends. Get me loaded, put a couple of drinks in me, and suddenly I'm at one with the universe. I'm standing on the roof of my building, howling at the moon. I get a couple more drinks in me, and suddenly I'm okay with me. Get me good and loaded, and there's this turn. I suddenly gain interest in my fellows. What happens is alcohol creates the illusion that my life is manageable. My experience is that it does so much for me that I don't care what it's doing to me. And everything this book is talking about is unless I can develop that sense of comfort and ease, that sense of peace, power, and purpose that I seek from alcohol through this spiritual process, a drunk like me will never stay here. You take alcohol away from me and you don't give me something better. I like a vine that has no nutrition. I will slowly spiritually mound. I, I, I will die here. That's why if everyone came to AA State, we'd be sitting in a football field. So what is it that stops me from being able to grow spiritually? What is it that blocks me? And that is everything I have found the books about. When they asked Michelangelo, how did you make the Statue of David? Michelangelo said, I never really made the Statue of David. I just chipped away everything that wasn't David. And there he was. What a marvelous idea. It's so funny because if you tell a five-year-old kid, go in your room and straighten out your room, you think he wants to do it? No way. You tell that same young man, I want you to go in your room and throw out all your old stuff. We'll buy you brand new stuff. How long would that take? What if it was really true that I could discover these old ideas, these things that were blocking me and be rid of them and suddenly have a powerful spiritual experience? The fundamental purpose of the book is to enable me to find a power that will solve my problem. It's very important I see where it's plural and when it's singular, because that problem is self-centered fear. I am driven by it. And that activates all of the defects in my life. I never saw it until much later in my recovery, what that really means and why is it? Because if you're new, it's not denial about the problem. Most of us don't have to think twice about whether we're alcoholic or not. What the problem for me is, is denial about the solution. That these time-tested steps, this roadmap to spiritual success, this way of life isn't going to work for me. And you know why I think that? Because it wasn't my idea. So right next to being separate, different, and alone, these fundamental core ideas, there is a parallel universe. And the three pillars of recovery in my life that I found in the big book are to be protected by some kind of God, to be accepted by self, and to be connected to a community. Those three ideas. And the first one, we hear it in the 11th chapter when we read a vision for you. That first piece is, is abandon yourself to God as you understand God, one through three, right? Admit your faults to him and your fellows, four through seven. Clear away the wreckage of your past. That first piece, to be protected by some kind of God. You go to the ocean with a cup, you get a cup full of water. Go to the ocean with your whole life. See what that relationship looks like. And you hear it in every meeting. Every time we read chapter five, what does it say? We ask for his care and protection with what? Complete abandon. You think you can abandon a ship and get back on? Very, very powerful. The second piece, to be accepted by self. That steps four through seven. What that means to me is I no longer need internal 
or external validation. You can look this up on your phone after the meeting. I develop what's called an internal locus of control. And the third piece, to be connected to a community. Protected by God, accepted by self, and connected to a community. And someone like me, and I mean, I, the weakest link in my family. My mom's brother committed suicide drunk. My father's brother committed suicide drunk. I come from a long line of suicide, mental illness, and alcoholism. And to be 23 and a half years away from that and now be the strongest link in that community, it is said that alcoholism is the only disease when treated that will actually leave the sufferer in a better position than if they never had the disease. And I would have never believed it. I would have never believed it until I got around actually the same name of this group, Fellowship of the Spirit, a, a, a very short lineage of dead people that I will recite. It goes Dan Sherman, Joe Hawk, right? Don Pritz, Gary Brown, Paul Martin, Paul Stanley, and Dr. Bob. It's that short. And those guys took me through the book. They showed me a very simple process by which not only I could live, but I could be rid of the things in me that were blocking me, the things that were blocking me from God, one through three, the things that were blocking me from an authentic, accepting relationship with self, and the things that were blocking me from others in steps eight and nine. Because forgiveness really is releasing someone from the prison of my own mind. It has nothing to do with other people. And there's some very specific exercises in the book, which I have, if I have time, I will talk about that when I really launched on that vigorous course of action in steps four through nine, what happened is I developed empathy, I developed compassion, and I developed the ability to forgive others. I also realized at that point that I had been a spiritual prisoner. I also discovered that part of the word spiritual, if you're new, is ritual. And the things that Alcoholics Anonymous are asking me to do, very simple, the three sides of the triangle, go to meetings, work the steps, help others, go to meetings, work the steps, help others, go to meetings, work the steps, help others. Because part of the word spiritual is ritual, that when I became willing to take these very, very simple actions, my entire perception of reality changed. And it's very interesting but even in bill's story if you just look at the second half of bill's story one of the ways to go through bill's story is to look at the first eight pages or his decline the second eight pages or his recovery and when ebby visited bill and went through this very simple process from the oxford group surrender catharsis restitution and service what happened is bill had two fundamental ideas the first one is on the next page it's the second leg of the triangle it says lois and i abandon ourselves with enthusiasm he did it with his wife to the idea of helping other alcoholics to a solution and at the very bottom of that page you will see the last piece where it says we attended meetings frequently so newcomers could find the fellowship they sought. It's so powerful. All of it's right there. And I was asked in the second half of Bill's story, what am I unwilling to do? What of those three things am I unwilling to do? Am I willing to abandon myself with enthusiasm to the idea of helping others? Am I willing to attend meetings frequently, not to get help, but to help others? Am I willing to go through this very simple process with the steps and start to do the things that Bill had said, where he talks about in step 10, to test his thinking, to go through this thing in and of himself, he is nothing. And he goes through this very, very simple process. And it's very, very powerful to trust God, clean house and help others. But these ideas, I have to really keep looking at what the big book is telling me. It's saying the same thing over and over and over again. It took me years to understand actually how brilliant Dr. Silkworth was. You know, Silkworth, it, it's funny because I'll say this, when I got out of my 28th residential treatment center, I know this is kind of comical, but um, I get out of this treatment center and the guy that's running the detox says to me, Adam, why don't you come back to our lovely hospital next week and tell all the patients here how you managed to stay sober an entire week if you can make it. And then he pretty much threw me off the property. And I, I was so hurt, you know, we we're sensitive, right? I was really offended by this, that I had a resentment. And for the next eight and a half years, I sat in two hours of bumper to bumper traffic from South LA County to the West Valley to tell a bunch of strangers in the detox that didn't care how I stayed sober another week. And what happened is I was tricked into service. 
What I never understood for all the years that I'd suffered with self-centeredness, with untreated alcoholism, was because I wasn't willing to give anything. I had completely missed the point of the exercise. And it never occurred to me when Bill Wilson got out of that third treatment center in Towns Hospital, and he said he was a broken man. He was overcome with waves of depression. Listen to what Bill says. He says that he'd lost everything in life worthwhile. Sound familiar? These are the prerequisites, right? And Bill gets a very simple idea. And this is not a history talk, but the idea was simple. He said, maybe if I go back in the hospital and talk to some of the patients, I'll feel better. That's all it was. In some ways, we could say that was a selfish idea. And we all know the story. He calls Dr. Silkworth. Dr. Silkworth is a double board certified physician, right? Certified in psychiatry and neurology. And, and Silkworth admits it. If you look at the doctor's opinion, it says with all our synthetic knowledge, our ultra modern standards, we're not well equipped. Silkworth, I have it written in big letters. I can't fix you. Silkworth, they couldn't fix people like me. I, was, I had the best psychiatrists, the best therapists, the best MFTs. I had everything at my disposal. I couldn't make it past the liquor store. And they're going to give me a pill that's going to take away my desire. My mom's like, maybe they can give you a pill that'll stop you chasing girls and riding motorcycles too. It's like ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So, so Silkworth feels and explains his inadequacy. And he allows Bill Wilson to come back into town's hospital. And what's so amazing is this is where it all changes. What Silkworth witnessed from 1935 to 1939, he says, the cases we followed are most interesting. Many of them are amazing. Dr. Silkworth, this really, really well-educated guy, he was at that time the foremost physician at the top hospital in the world. All the, you know, the trust fund babies from all over Zurich and Europe would come to see Silkworth. And he said he couldn't fix people like us. And what he said he saw from 1935 to 1939, Dr. Silkworth said was absolutely amazing. He was, out, he was so amazed that if you look at the first endorsement in the big book where it says you can absolutely rely on anything these men say about themselves was a letter of credibility given to Bill Wilson by a double board certified physician that he could go into any hospital that treated alcoholism with this little letter and Silkworth's phone number on it and say, can I please talk to drunks? It was like almost like a, a hall pass. And it's so amazing because you really wonder what did Bill know in 1935, really? He had this little idea that he developed through the Oxford group, surrender, catharsis, restitution, and service. He'd gone through this process with Abby. And funny enough, Dr. Bob had also been exposed to the same fundamental ideas, yet Bob couldn't get sober because he didn't understand the, the, the craving that Dr. Silkworth had discovered. And you can circle the word craving all the way through the doctor's opinion. That physical piece. But what's so amazing, and the reason I'm talking about this is because I don't know if Silkworth knew what he was saying, but when he says restless, irritable, and discontent, we talk about mind, body, and spirit, the affliction of alcoholism. Look at what it's saying. The mind is irritable. The body is restless. The spirit is discontent right? And we have new words for that. I think the new word for restless now is ADD. But see, I don't have ADD. Because if I was sitting in a meeting with Steve over there, and I knew Steve had a million dollars in the trunk of his car, I'd probably follow him home from the meeting. I have what's called selective interest disorder. I'm only interested in things that concern me. When I become, it's like I ordered liquor and then I forgot. No, I'm sorry. When I be, I'm obsessed with something, there is nothing that gets in my way. Nothing. I don't have ADD. I have a restlessness in my body and I have a discontentment in my spirit. And what that means is the shine wears off everything right away. It doesn't matter what I get. I get have a brand new car. I've been saving all year for that car. I don't even get it off the dealer's lot. It's the wrong color. I get a new job. I'm making more money I've ever made in my life. I start doing the math. I'm getting ripped off. I get a new house. I'm not even out of escrow. I can't stand the neighbors. Hate them and their dog. So I have something else that's going on. And what I understand now is it is this spiritual maladjustment that drives me to the obsession. The obsession drives me to the allergy and the allergy kills me. That's why he says, when I straighten out spiritually, only then will I straighten out mentally and physically. But here's the catch to the whole thing. What I didn't understand is the mastering of 10, 11, and 12. See, if I continue to do 10, if I continue to watch 
for these ideas, what happens is it my mind starts to recover. If I am still and know that there is a God, contemplative prayer, right? Centering prayer, petitionary prayer, my body starts to become still. And if I'm of service, I have purpose. I start to recover from the discontentment. See, 10, 11, and 12 interface with restless, irritable, and discontent perfectly. If I do these real, simple, straightforward actions, I will guarantee you, if you are new, you will recover from a hopeless state of mind and body. I cannot say this more, but if you have the chance to get around some people that can take you through the book and show you these very simple things. You will be rocketed into a completely new dimension of existence. I will say one last thing, and I'm going to finish up. One of the things I discovered, one of my friends here, he's worth 900 million. I live in a really nice area, but I kind of have a mediocre life. But he says to me, Adam, there's two kinds of people on this planet. There's guests and there's hosts, okay? Now, the guest is never happy. There's no onions on my burger. I wanted a king size bed. I can't believe I can't believe what you got me for my birthday, honey. You can have you ever lived with a guest. They were redecorating my house when I'm out of town. But see, the host is completely different. The host comes at life from being helpful, from being kind, from being supportive. Bill Wilson was a grandiose, sensitive, immature materialist. And what happened? He was so self-important that he was broken of that. Bill Wilson came in, like a lot of us, with the mind of a king, but he developed what we call the heart of a servant. That is what is required, to have the heart of a servant. Without that, this doesn't work. I'm sorry. I was stripped of everything that mattered to me. And now, in fact, it, it, that would be the second half of this talk, to talk about how to have both at the same time, to have a beautiful material life and a spiritual life, and to let those things both be compatible. So I'll close with this. If someone did to me what I did to myself, I hate to say it, but I would have killed them. If someone did to me what I did to others, I would have killed them. And then I come to AA, and you want me to pray to God? I didn't want God to find out where I was. I was bankrupt in those very primary relationships. If you're new and you look at the 12 steps by design, they remedy those three relationships. Steps one through three, recreate and develop a relationship with God. Four through seven, recreate and develop a relationship with self. Steps eight and nine, recreate and develop a relationship with others. It's a very simple idea. 10 maintains, develops, and grows my relationship with self. 11 maintains, develops, and grows my relationship with God, as we just talked about. 12 maintains, develops, and grows my relationship with others. So coming out of the steps, a selfish, self-centered drunk like me is not only easily able to control my desire for alcohol, that's right out of the doctor's opinion, but for the first time in my life, I'm able to live in harmony with God, self, and others. There was a great spiritual teacher. He was asked, what's the most important thing of all your teachings? He said, love God with all thy heart, love thy neighbor as thyself. And you know what? If God scares you out of AA and you're a real drunk, don't worry about it. Booze will scare you back in. So in one through three, I give it up. Four through seven, I clean it up. Eight and nine, I make it up. 10, 11, and 12, I keep it up. And again, as the result of that, I'm able to navigate around the drama. I'm able to match calamity with serenity. I'm able to stay in fit spiritual condition. There's a whole piece in chapter five. And what it's really saying, if you're new, is if people have to change for me to be happy, I will never be happy. How to be happy in an imperfect world, laying in the sunshine, complaining about the state of the nation. Think about what they're saying there. This delusion that the world has to change for me to be happy has to be broken. And then I have to have peace, power, and purpose in my life. If you can do those things, you can turn this curse, if you're new, into an absolutely amazing life. I wish if you were new, I could get with you for a couple of weeks and take you on this journey. Thank you very much.